Hey guys, we are going to read chapter 16 to chapter 18. Finn. You can go help Chess or Emma, Finn told Natalie as he opened Mom's closet. I've got this. Finn hoped she couldn't tell that what he really wanted was for her to leave so he could bury his face in Mom's clothes. Maybe he could pull them down from the hangers and just curl up in a nest of Mom's shirts until she came back. They'd still smell like her as long as nobody washed them, right? Finn sniffed his sleeve and there it was. Mom's unique odor, a mix of vanilla and spring breeze laundry detergent. Until, excuse me, with maybe some cinnamon and grass stain lurking underneath. <coughs> and apples. Mom's clothes also smelled like apples. I, Natalie began and Finn forced himself to turn around and look at her. She stood in the doorway, half in, half out of the room. I want to help. And Chess and Emma don't trust me. If they don't trust you, why would I? Finn wanted to say. Most of the time, Finn said what he wanted to say as soon as he thought it, but he'd never before thought it was possible that he'd never see his mother again. So right now, he didn't trust his own brain or his own mouth. I will see Mom again, he told himself. I will, I will, I will soon. He was like the train in the book for the little kid, chugging out, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can, I can. He liked feeling that there wasn't room in his brain for any other thoughts besides that. He ignored Natalie and began pushing clothes from one side of the closet to the other, even though he didn't really believe he could find a laptop behind or underneath them. He just liked the way moving the clothes set off more puffs of mom's smell. He heard the doorbell downstairs and then Mrs. Morales' powerful voice calling Natalie, Finn, Emma, and uh, Chess, what's going on? This was supposed to be a quick stop, remember? Good thing Chess is downstairs, Finn thought. He'll explain everything and then Mrs. Morales will understand why we have to stay here longer. Mrs. Morales was a grown-up, a mom, and when she heard about the messages on mom's phone, she'd probably say, why didn't you show me that right away? Of course, that's a mistake. In fact, your mom just called and she's on her way home right now. You won't have to spend the night at my house after all. But Finn didn't hear the rumble of Chess's voice downstairs answering Mrs. Morales. Instead, he heard Natalie's footsteps heading out towards the landing. Mom, go back to the car before you start sneezing all over the place, Natalie yelled. She was standing at the top of the stairs. The kids needed a few things their mom didn't pack, so we're getting everything together. Just five more minutes, okay? Are you sure everything's all right? Mrs. Morales asked. Of course, Natalie said. Now go away before your whole face swells up. Just five more minutes, Mrs. Morales said. Then she sneezed. I'll be waiting in the car, hurry. Natalie came back into mom's room. You didn't tell her about the text messages, Finn asked. Wouldn't she help was the word Finn wanted. No, that wasn't strong enough. He wanted Mrs. Morales to solve everything. He wanted her to undo the text messages, make sure so they never existed in mom's phone, and so Finn, Emma, and Chess, and Natalie had never seen them. He wanted Mrs. Morales to fly to Chicago and back in the next five minutes and bring mom home just like that. Sometimes it almost seemed like mom had superpowers, taking care of everything Finn and Emma and Chess needed. Weren't all moms like that? Natalie snorted. You do not want my mom to know about the text messages, she said. She'd make everything worse, believe me. She's the one you can't trust. Mom's far, far away, Finn thought. I can't trust Natalie. She says I can't trust her mom either. All I have is Emma and Chess. It was the most grown-up thing Finn had ever done. That he kept standing there peering into Mom's closet, when all he really wanted to do was run downstairs, grab hold of Emma and Chess, and never let go. Chapter 17, Emma. Math. Emma thought as she descended the basement stairs, square roots, prime numbers, pi, those were the most comforting things Emma could think of. They were constants. Two was always the square root of four. One, three, five, seven, eleven were always prime. Pi was always 3.14 with an endless string of other numbers behind it. Mom had always been a, a constant in Emma's life too. Yeah, well, she's still somewhere, Emma told herself. She hasn't ceased to exist, and even if she thinks there's some reason she can't come home, we can find her and prove it to her that she can. Emma picked up the plastic bag of dirty kitty litter and put it in the waste basket by the bottom of the stairs, even though the kids were really supposed to put all the litter bags directly in the trash can outside. 
Mom will be so grateful when we rescue her. She's not going to get mad about a kitty litter. Emma thought. She regarded the main point of the basement, the saggy couch that had been retired from the living room upstairs after Finn spilled grape Kool-Aid on it. The foosball table that could convert into a mini ping pong table or mini pool table. The bucket of Nerf balls, the cush dartboard, the tub of Legos. She remembered Finn's friend Tyrell asking once, isn't this your family room? Where's the TV? And Finn had said indignantly, it's our rec room. Don't you think we'd wreck a TV if it was down here? That was when mom explained that really a rec room stood for recreation room and that a TV would distract her when she was working in the boring room. Mom's little closed off office at the far side of the basement. Why was a TV distracting when Finn and Tyrell screaming at the top of their lungs wasn't? Emma stepped past the couch and the foosball table and went straight to the door to the boring room. It was locked. Sure, Mom, Emma thought, because of course that's going to keep Chess and Finn and me out. She walked over to the couch, bent down to lift the little flap of fabric that covered the couch's legs. She felt around the couch's middle leg from the front. The leg looked like a solid block of wood, but it had a not not notched carved into the back of it. Emma pulled a little metal key out of the notch. Mom knows Chess, Finn, and I all know about this hiding place, doesn't she? Mom thought, sitting back up. They would played hide-and-seek games with Mom where the hidden thing was a coin or a poly pocket. Hadn't Mom herself sometimes hidden the coin or the doll in the couch leg for the kids to find? It was hard to remember, but those games seemed a long ago, maybe even before Emma started school. But if Mom wasn't hiding this key from Chess, Finn, and me, then who was she hiding it from? Emma wondered. Just that thought made Emma want to start reciting reliable things to herself again. Fibonacci numbers, multiplication tables, the Pythagorean theorem. Hey, Emma, come on up. Chess shouted from the top of the stairs. I found mom's computer and Finn and Natalie found the one she lets us use. She must have taken the one from down there with her. Oh good, Emma thought. I don't even have to look in the boring room. This wasn't scientific or logical, but Emma was a little afraid of the boring room. Outside of the boring room, mom was so mom. Always there instantly when one of the kids scraped a knee or wanted to show off a bike trick or was just exploding with a brilliant new idea. But if mom was in the boring room she kept the door shut if one of the kids knocked there was something a long pulse before mom answered yes do you need something and even if mom answered immediately Emma had discovered that it was possible to count to a hundred sometimes sometimes even more before mom inched the door open stepped out carefully and shut it behind her and finally peered down to Emma with her usual amount of concern it was like the boring room made mom not mom those text messages on mom's phone were really not mom, Emma thought. Just the text messages about mom not calling them were not momish. The one about mom not coming back made it seem like she'd been swallowed up by some place like the boring room, and she completely became the person she was in the boring room, not the person she was everywhere else in the world. And you're being silly, Emma, told herself. Not logical, not like yourself either. She sat still for a moment, holding the key, and then she forced herself to walk over to the boring room door. It was like she had something to prove. If she could face the boring room, then she and Chess and Finn could figure out where Mom was and go rescue her. Emma put the key in the lock and turned it. She heard the click that meant the lock had given away. Quickly, before she lost her nerve, she shoved the door open, reached for the light switch on the wall. The dim glow overhead revealed a room with blank walls, Mostly empty bookshelves and a desk and a chair that was so unremarkable that Emma could almost believe they came from a store called Amazingly Boring Office Furniture for Home. That was a joke Mom had made once, remembering that Emma's eyes go a little misty. Never mind that, Emma told herself. Does anything in here look different than usual? It was hard to tell because when she was last time with Emma, uh, it was hard to tell because when was the last time Emma actually looked into this room? She had a vague memories of being a little kid playing with Finn out in the rec room while mom sat in the desk in the boring room with the door open. Maybe that was so long ago that mom needed to keep an eye on all of them at the same time, even while she worked. Emma could call up a fuzzy image in her mind from those days, mom's eyes barely visible over the top of the laptop. Oh, duh, Emma thought, of course, the laptop's missing. It always sat in the middle of the desk and it's now not there. 
Maybe Emma's mind wasn't working very well right now. Maybe she was expecting too much to think that her brain could work at all the words of mom's text messages for the next week. It still burned into her eyeballs. I have to stay away for good to protect. Emma reached for the light switch to turn it off again, but just shifting her position that much put her at a different angle. Now she could see the edge of a piece of paper sticking out the top of mom's drawer. A clue, Emma thought. She wanted to strongly believe that she left the light on and circled around the other side of the desk. She pulled out the drawer and the paper got stuck, smashed into an accordion-style pleat. Emma gently eased the paper out, flipped it over, and smoothed it. The paper was a fuzzy copy of the back of Mom's phone, a reproduction of the crooked heart drawn on it. But it was only the heart. The words, we love you, Mommy, didn't show up. Emma wanted to cry all over again. Nothing made sense. Why would mom make a copy of that drawing when she always had her phone with the original drawing on the case right it with her? Except mom didn't have the phone with her now. She doesn't have this copy of that drawing either. Emma started to shove the picture back into the drawer, but then Emma saw that had been hidden in the drawer beneath the paper, mom's work computer, the one she always used in the boring room. So mom went on a business trip and she didn't take her business computer with her? Or any computer, Emma thought. She left every single one of her computers at home. It wasn't exactly foolproof logic, but Emma was pretty sure she could make a dedication. She could make a deduction. <laughs> Mom wasn't on a business trip at all. Chapter 18, Chess. The sun was still shining brightly when Chess stepped outside. That surprised him. It felt like the whole world should have gone dark while they were inside the house, like the sun should never come out again. This was a feeling Chess remembered when, he had, when Dad died. Mom isn't dead, Chess told himself. I'm sure she's fine and we have all our computers now, so we're going to find her and everything will be okay. Still, Chess felt like his feet had gone ahead of him as he climbed down the porch steps. His suitcase pulled off balance. His legs just didn't feel sturdy. It didn't help that Finn kept trying to walk so close behind him that the two of them might as well have been glued together. It also didn't help that he could see how pale and drawn Emma and Finn's faces were, how they were weaving and stumbling just as badly as Chess. Don't say any about any of this to my mom, Natalie hissed to Chess and Emma and Finn as he turned to the lock the front door. Evidently, she'd taken the key from Chess while he wasn't paying attention. Evidently, now she was slipping the key back into his hand. Chess felt like there could be all sorts of things happening that he might have missed. Why shouldn't we tell your mom? Emma asked Natalie. Chess was aware enough to see Natalie bite her lip. Mom will go crazy, Natalie said. She'll call social services, the police, the FBI, and the TV news. Don't we want the police and FBI helping us? Finn asked. So innocently, he practiced chirp the words. Don't we want grown-ups who know what they're doing to find mom? Natalie shot a glance over at Chess, over Finn's head. Your mom said she wrote a letter that's just for you, Natalie said. Don't you want to see that for yourself before anyone else sticks their nose in your business? Chess didn't know why Natalie kept looking at him like that. He kind of wanted to say, can't you tell I'm not really that much older than Emma and Finn? Can't you tell that when I saw that text message from mom, I went back to being a four-year-old again? Chess, Emma, and Finn tripped down the driveway towards Mrs. Morales' SUV. Somehow, Natalie got ahead of them. She guided them into putting their suitcases on the back of the car. Then she yanked to open both doors on the passenger side, one for her, one for the other three kids. That was stupid, Mom, Natalie complained as she slipped into the front seat. Why didn't you pick up the suitcases before you picked up the kids? The bags were right beside the front door. You, shouldn't, you wouldn't have sneezed too much. And now these kids are homesick and missing their mommy, and it's all your fault. Chess helped Finn up into the SUV, into the middle row of seats again. Chess and Emma followed as Mrs. Morales answered Natalie. For your information, young lady, I was working right up until I picked you up from school. Would you have preferred taking the bus? No. Why would you even say that? Natalie snarled back. You don't understand anything. I've got all this homework to do and I just spent a whole hour helping that little boy find his lovey so he could sleep tonight. Chess noticed that Finn was clutching a teddy bear that was missing an ear and eye because he and his friends Tyrell liked to use it as a football. It wasn't Finn's lovey. Natalie told me to bring this, Finn whispered in Chess's ear as a prop. 
If you spent less time texting, you'd have plenty of time to do your homework. Mrs. Morales told Natalie, even as she started the car and pulled away from the curb. Anyway, you weren't there an hour. It was barely 20 minutes. Right, and you still thought you had to come in and hurry us up? Natalie moaned. Mom, you're so embarrassing. And then while Mrs. Morales was peering right and left, preparing to turn into the next street, Natalie spun around and winked at Chess, Emma, and Finn. Oh, Chess thought. Is she fighting with her mom on purpose? To distract attention from Finn's teary face? From the fact that all three of us are just numb and clumsy and stupid right now? Mrs. Morales made the turn. Chess could see her eyes peering back at them in the rearview mirror. Kids, I'm so sorry that my daughter's being so rude, she said. I promise we'll make this a fun night for you. We'll order pizza. You can have any kind you want. And well, Natalie says she's outgrown it, but we still have a trampoline in our backyard. And Chess's ears buzzed. He felt too busy to listen well. He kind of grunted when Mrs. Morales paused. It seemed she needed an answer, but he had no idea what he was agreeing to or disagreeing to. A grunt could mean anything. Mom's text messages. Could those mean something different than what we think, too? He needed to see her phone again. To force himself to read the horrible words again, maybe he just imagined them. Maybe he'd find an April Fool's or a psych got you or ha ha ha, just kidding, right below. But they stuffed Mom's phone and charger and all the computers in the suitcases. Chess would have had to take his seatbelt off and climb over the back row to reach them. He knew that wouldn't go over very well with Mrs. Morales. He didn't know if Natalie was right, that they shouldn't tell Mrs. Morales what they found, but he felt overwhelmed at the thought of saying anything. Even, huh, or, huh, huh, seemed beyond him now. How well do Mrs. Morales and Mom even know each other? If none of us remember Mom talking about her, Chess wondered, what if Mrs. Morales just decides that Mom is a bad person? He didn't quite understand what Natalie meant when she talked about Mrs. Morales calling social services, but he could see why it would be a problem to call the police. What if they thought Mom was a bad person for leaving her kids behind and saying she was never coming back? What if they tracked her down to arrest her? Sometime must have passed 15 minutes, 20. Mrs. Morales aimed the SUV into a long driveway that, driveway that wound up a hill. The house at the top of the hill was easily three or four times the size of the Greystones' house. Chess got a lump in his throat, thinking about how Mom always called their house a cozy Cape Cod. She had a way of saying those words that made Chess feel a little sorry for anyone who didn't live there. Is that your house, Natalie? Finn asked, gaping at the mansion ahead of them. It's enormous. Maybe he'd been chattering away all along. Finn talked whether he was happy, sad, worried, or sometimes even sound asleep. Yeah, Mom got the house in a divorce, Natalie said bitterly. Natalie, Mrs. Morales scolded, stop being so difficult. You don't have to tell the whole world everything. Besides, Chess, Emma let out a sound that could have been a snort or a nervous giggle. Oh, it was kind of funny, or ironic anyway, that Natalie was getting in trouble for telling too much when really she and the Greystones were keeping a gigantic secret. They took the suitcases inside and Mrs. Morales pointed um, out where everyone would sleep. Chess couldn't keep the room straight. Maybe Mrs. Morales and Natalie had so many bedrooms that they could each use a different room every night of the week if they wanted. I'll give the kids a tour of the rest of the house while you're ordering the pizza, Natalie told her mom. Then as she shepherded them down a hallway, she said in a softer voice, Mom likes to eat dinner early and go to bed early because she gets up at 5 a.m. to exercise. So we'll meet at 10 p.m. in her office where she won't be able to hear us. She made her voice loud enough again, loud enough to carry down the hall to her mother. And this is mom's office. Chess thought time would drag until they could finally meet up and pull out the computers. But evidently, weird things happen when you're feeling completely numb. And Mrs. Morales made them play on the trampoline. Then they ate and did homework. Then she made them play Wii for a while. And she made them play a long, boring game of Monopoly right before bedtime. During all those times, Chess would just be sitting there thinking about Mom and suddenly realize half an hour had gone by. Finally, they all brushed their teeth and Mrs. Morales had trucked the younger two in bed and said to Chess, Are you like Natalie, saying you're too old for a bedtime story? He shot out a panicked, Yes, and she left him alone. Then it was time to creep back down the stairs, clutching the laptop that had been shoved into a suitcase. He was joined in the dark hallway by Emma and Finn, each bearing laptops of their own. Emma also held Mom's phone. 
Don't giggle, Chess whispered, because normally both of them would have. But now they looked up at him, their faces shrouded in the shadows. He could tell that tonight neither of them found anything amusing. Chess switched his whispered instructions to, Don't worry, we're going to find out everything. They tiptoed down to Mrs. Morales' office, and Natalie stood in the shadowy doorway and waved them in. Everybody's here, she asked. You've got everything? Good. Now I can shut the door and turn on the light. The four of them stood blinking in sudden brightness. Chess's eyes took forever to adjust. Are you sure your mom won't hear us in here? Emma asked, pushing a stray lock of hair behind her ear. She'd lost her ponytail rubber band on the trampoline. Her hair had puffed out again like so much dandelion fuzz. Chess was torn between wanting to smooth her hair down himself and wanting to snarl at Natalie. Don't you dare say anything about Emma's hair being a mess. She's in fourth grade. Fourth graders don't have to care about stuff like that. But Natalie was moving briskly towards her mother's desk, a piece of furniture so vast and shiny that it seemed like it might have had its own gravitational pull. I'm sure, she told Emma, this room is soundproofed. Soundproofed? Why? Finn asked, his eyes wide. What does your mom do? I mean, besides making big pictures of her own face. He pointed behind the desk. Chess noticed the whole pile of signs leaned against the wall. They all held the words for sale or sold along with Mrs. Morales' picture. She's a realtor, Natalie said, as if that was completely unimportant. She sells houses. At least that's the job we talk about. Does she have another job you can't talk about? Emma asked. Can you tell us? Natalie tilted her head to the side, which made her hair stream down like silk. We told you everything our mom does, Finn said. Okay, Natalie agreed. On the side, mom's a private investigator. That's what she calls it. I call it a professional snoop. My grandmother called it being a busybody. Mom spies on men who are... She glanced at Finn. Let's just say they're just not good husbands. Mom gives the wives proof so they're an upper hand in the divorce. Chess thought about what Natalie had assumed about his mom, that she had a bad boyfriend, that that was why she had got had to go away. Mom didn't have a boyfriend. Chess would have known, but she was talking on the phone to some man last night. He remembered... Joe. Mom had not sounded like she was talking to a boyfriend, more like a co-worker, an employee, a boss. Mom didn't have any co-workers or employees or bosses either. She never used to such a surly torn tone with clients. She was always nice to them. She was always nice to everyone. Chess saw that Emma was peering on the screen of Mom's phone. Can I? He whispered. She handed it over. Chess opened the call history. If he could find out who mom had talked to last night, that would be a huge clue. But the call history was empty. So were mom's contacts. So were all of her emails and text messages, except for the automatic ones she sent up for Mrs. Morales. Natalie had stopped talking and was watching Chess stare at his mother's phone. Chess gave the phone back to Emma. Let's talk about our mom, he said. He didn't care that now he sounded rude. He slid the HP laptop he'd been carrying onto the desk. This is the computer that mom uses the most often. She doesn't usually let us use it to do homework or play games, so it's probably the one she'd write a letter on. If she didn't want us to see that letter until he had to gulp, until next week. Okay, you should start with that one, Natalie agreed. This is the computer mom lets us use for homework and stuff, Emma said, putting the battered Dell laptop beside his and opening the screen. This is the one from the boring room, Finn said, adding the third laptop. They powered up all three computers, and Chess felt a gurgle of tension in his stomach, like before a huge test, only much, much worse. How about if I look through your mom's phone while you three... Natalie began. You stay away from mom's phone, Emma said, hugging it to her chest. Didn't she know there was nothing on the phone worth seeing? Chess didn't say anything. Okay, okay, Natalie murmured. Still, she hovered behind the three gray stones. It made Chess even more nervous. Finn elbowed Chess. Do you know Mom's password for this laptop, he asked, or Emma, do you? No, Chess and Emma said together. Then I can't see anything, Finn said dejectedly. His shoulders slumped and he looked like he might start crying again. Next time we go back to your house, we can look for your mom's password, Natalie said in the fake, cheerful voice people use with toddlers. Maybe she has it written down somewhere. He's eight, not three, Chess wanted to yell at her. Stop being so, so patronizing was the word he was looking for but maybe he also meant stop being so helpful natalie was acting like this was her problem too it wasn't and now that she's shown them soundproof room why didn't she just go back upstairs with her room 
with her mom. Here, Finn, Chess said, stepping back. Why don't you stand between Emma and me? You can go back and forth between looking at these computers with us. You might see something we miss. He shut down the laptop from the boring room and maneuvered Finn between him and Emma. Oddly, Emma didn't move to the side to make room. She stood frozen, staring at the laptop screen. Chess followed her gaze. She reached the desktop with the background picture of all three kids at Halloween last year. Finn is a clown. Emma is a ninja. Chess is a skeleton. Finn and Emma were totally cracking up, but Chess's face was hidden behind his mask. Though actually, the image of all three kids was largely hidden because they had so many files and games and shortcut links strewn about the desktop. It was hard to find anything in that mess, and then Chess saw that Emma had the cursor hovering over a file marked for the kids. Was this here before? Emma asked. I never saw it, Finn said, but his voice was so hushed and scared he sounded like someone else. Chess just shook his head. Emma clicked the mouse. Chess started the started st started to object. Did he want to warn his brother and sister that maybe he should read the file first? Maybe he should protect them from whatever it was he was going to say? A box appeared. Emma hadn't opened the file. She was only checking its properties. Mom saved this at 4 a.m., Emma whispered. Just this morning. So open it, Natalie cried behind them. Emma looked back over her shoulder. I I'm afraid, she admitted. Emma, afraid? Emma was fearless. Emma could face down math problems that made Chess's head hurt. And one time, when she was only a third grader, Chase had seen her wait into a pile of sixth graders who were fighting, and she screamed, don't hit the little guy. And then the kid who was being bullied just walked away. This was scarier than that. Chess himself felt like he'd forgotten how to breathe. We open it together, he suggested. All three of us. He put his hand over Emma's, and Finn put his hand on top. Chess thought maybe it was actually Finn who had the courage to push down. The file opened, and Chess blinked the words on the screen into focus. Dearest Chess, Emma, and Finn, I love you so much, and this is why I had to do this. I'm sure you have questions. This letter will tell you everything you need to know. Only the three of you will be able to read it. Eagerly, Chess moved on to the next paragraph, but it was all gibberish. He raked his finger down to the touchpad, scrolling through the rest of the letter, page after page of more gibberish. After the first three sentences, nothing in the rest of the letter made any sense. All right, until tomorrow.